Hello. Today we have the fortune to have Laura Allen here with us. Many of us have been hearing about the need to educate our children and equip them with a 21st century skills. Laura has been doing this for many years and is really pushing the envelope on how you develop these skills through Benmi and through RoboFan. Laura, thank you very much for joining us and, and could you please explain what these fantastic programs are about? Sure. Um, Vision Education and Media is uh, the, the mother company and uh, we provide schools, community centers, homeschool kids, teachers with creative ways to use technology. Um, and we do that in very um, under-resourced communities such as the South Bronx and we also do it in very resourced heavy communities uh, such as private schools in New York City or private and public schools in um, wealthy suburban areas around New York. Uh, RoboFun has become a very um, popular name describing our work and refers to one part of our work which is our fee-based programs for kids at our office and fee-based programs for kids at schools. So ultimately they are the same thing. Um, RoboFund refers more to just the after-school programs that are paid for directly by parents. Uh, but we have a whole other line of work which is generally where we started, which is working in high-needs communities, providing teachers and kids with uh, creative ways to use technology in ways that are very much self uh, uh, it very much based on the interests of children to start with. And how long have you been doing this and what kind of results have you seen? I have been doing it for 30 years um, and the results that I see are that it is much more front and center in, in everyone's mind today than it was 30 years ago. Um, I have found that um, I recently sat down with a colleague of mine from the MIT Media Lab, Mitchell Resnick, and uh, we both were laughing because uh, we have been teaching programming for 30 years and now suddenly it's called coding and it's really cool. Uh, but in a way it's a rebranding of what we have been doing, which it's great. It's great that it's front and center, uh, but it's funny in a way. What kind of effects does it have on children? How do children evolve uh, through, through these kind of programs? I think that when you create programs and allow children to make a lot more decisions, the effect that you have is that children want to learn and want to decide about their learning experience. Um, I remember very early in my career uh, I taught at a very conservative boys school um, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan called the Buckley School. And one day I had given the kids a large project to work on and I wanted to bring all the kids together to see how they were doing and discuss what their problems were, what their successes were. And one little boy says to me, Mrs. Allen, I don't have time to meet. I have too much work that I want to get done. Um, and it was such a great moment of how he had owned the project um, and he wanted so much to work on it that he didn't want to stop and talk about it. Uh, and I think that's, that's always my goal is that kids can own their work and enjoy their work. Um, and I think that kids, kids want to learn. Um, and if something's going wrong, it's usually not about the child, but it's about the learning environment. Laura, in Latin America, over 50% of our children do not finish high school. A good chunk of that has to do with the fact that they don't find relevance in, in what they learn at school um, and, and that they're bored, uh, which I think is not something extraordinary uh, today in, in schools. What kind of effects uh, have you seen in terms of bringing inclusion uh, or building inclusion through these kind of programs? Is there are these kind of programs um, adequate to, to bring um, low-income people into the education, uh, the, the information economy? Um, I ultimately think that in an awful lot of cases they're right to be bored. 
um, and that schools are, are in a very desperate place trying to meet their needs without enough resources to meet them. Um, and that <clears throat> the type of learning environments that I'm talking about that are child-centered work in the in high income, low income, in all different areas. Um, but it is a question of setting up the learning experience for children um, so that they're not being taught at, but that we're working with them. Um, and they are making many, many more decisions. Um, for instance, what, they're, what they want to learn about um, is a starting place versus the adults making the decisions as to what they think they should learn. So imagine that I, that I, I go with my kid. I know some South Americans who have gone to, to New York to take their kids to, to your program. That I go to, to this program or that you implemented here in, in South America. Uh, what would happen uh, when, when we arrive? What would be the experience of my child like? Um, I think this sounds very basic and maybe even a little silly, but to start with, we, we vet our teachers very carefully and we want to make sure they actually like children um, and they want to work with children. So when I hire people, I can teach them the technology things, but I, I generally can't teach them to like children. Um, so the most important thing that I feel is that adults like the energy, like the ideas, uh, are not trying to presuppose their values on the situation. Um, so they'll be greeted in our reception area by seeing a lot of different robots around them um, in, you know, in a display case, um, and they'll, you know, we'll ask them, you know, what are they here for, and then we'll introduce them to their teacher. Um, the other thing that we do is in our classes, we only have about 12 kids at a time working with one teacher. Occasionally parents beg us to add their kid and we're already full and if we do that we add an assistant. So there's a very high ratio of support. So that if you're stuck you're not sitting there waiting for a long period of time. So um, you, have the kid, you have the teacher and you have the robots and now what happens? Uh, well, you will enter a class with one of three or four different things. Either you'll be making and programming robots, you'll be making video games, um, you'll learn how to code, you'll learn how to design your characters, um, you might be making a stop motion animation similar to Wallace and Gromit. I don't know if that's popular in South America as it has been here, but uh, uh, and we're just getting started on some um, mind Minecraft classes as well. So you will have, you or your parents will have decided what class you're going to go into. Um, you and your classmates will sit in a circle to start with so your teacher can introduce him or herself and we'll talk about what we're going to do today. So let's say you're in a robotics class. You will then um, we have a lot of different curriculums, but one that we've been using more and more that's very popular is our challenge-based curriculum, where we'll have a goal for you and your robot. Um, for instance, one of them is the RoboFund Parcel and Delivery Service. So, so we give you the blueprint for the basics of a robot, um, but that blueprint only has the robot going forward, backwards, that kind of thing. And then you have to um, design the course. So we give you a big piece of plywood, like uh, four feet by four feet. And the 12 kids come together and they decide, OK, where's the post office? And where do the packages have to get delivered? Um, and a couple kids may say, I want to take over designing the board. We'll say, that's great. A couple others are going to say, I want to design the um, attachments that are going to go on the robot. Um, a few others will say, okay, well, we want to be the programmers. Um, and, you know, we will help guide this and make these decisions. Um, we might decide that it's a, a, a group that we should have two boards, uh, one for six kids to work on for the same project and another for six kids. Um, I think dif a difference in our programs versus a lot of programs is that we're very resource heavy. Um, it's a little bit like as an adult if we said to you, you know, you're going to come to work today, but um, 
By the way, you may have to share your laptop with three to five other people for the day, but you can do that because it's teamwork and that's good for you, which is often the lines we use with kids that just really don't, don't fly. So um, in terms of building the robot, we do have kids work in pairs, but we also have the sensitivity that some kids may not work well that way, and then they can work on their own. Um, could you tell me um, some stories about people who have projects that ch uh, children have accomplished that you're really pr proud of, or transformations that you have seen in attitude, behavior uh, of children, particularly low-income uh, children, if, if possible? Sure. Um, well, this summer, and, and this summer we have summer camp, and actually we're starting to have winter summer camp in January from fa for families from um, South America and the Southern Hemisphere. But and it's a mixture of kids from all different incomes who come. And uh, we designed a Rube Goldberg sculpture. And that means that all of the parts of the sculpture, each part triggers another part. So that everyone designed, um, if you imagine, um, a large um, robotic course where one robot went two feet and hit another robot. That robot then slid down a slide and hit another robot. That robot then traveled across um, like a tram, like an electric wire. Um, and I've been doing this now for 30 years. And I, when I was a classroom teacher, this was one of my projects. Um, we have it on our website. Um, it was actually filmed by a, a brother, an eight-year-old brother on his iPad, and he did not a terrible job. He did quite a good job of it. Um, but that was a project that was involved every one of those kids completely. Um, my staff were so in it that they stayed Thursday night uh, until about 8 o'clock just to make sure every part of it worked. Um, the next morning, all the parents came, and I, I was very, very proud of the kids. Um, in that situation, one of the assistants is from um, one of our high schools we work with is called Alfred E. Smith High School in the South Bronx, and it is one of three automotive academies, um, meaning that the kids graduate with a dual diploma, a regular what's called a regents diploma, plus a diploma to help um, to allow them to get a job in the auto industry. And Generally, this area of the South Bronx is, is tough. And we have interns all summer long from all different socioeconomic backgrounds, but I always want to make sure that some of our interns are from the South Bronx. Uh, so one of these boys is going into his sophomore year, um, and he was one of the interns in this summer program. And not all of the interns last. Uh, they have to get to work on time. They have to do what we ask of them. This boy, not only has he lasted, but he's gotten himself into more work with us because we can always use really good assistance. So he's working for us for many classes on Saturdays and Sundays. So uh, that's one moment of feeling sort of the full circle of how it's all working and feeling really good about it. Yeah, amazing. I mean, when, I mean, Usually you see kids not wanting to go to school. In this case, you see a, a kid going Saturdays and Sundays and, and being right. really motivated about right. it. Yes, yes. So you're gi giving them a space where they can blossom. Yes. And, and technology is the tool, but it doesn't always have to be the tool. But I think the key really is giving kids the space where they can blossom. Um, where they can make more decisions about... I, th I think we're a little terrified as a society to give decision-making power to children um, because we think, you know, well, they'll just eat cake all the time, you know, and I think we don't realize that learning is something they, that they deeply, there's a deep drive in all of us to learn um, and that, you know, kids being given choices is not a bad thing. Um, it, I think it's what helps us have a society where we have more Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, people who have made a really important decisions. Um, and I think that you have to start doing that as a, a young person to be able to handle that in society as, as an adult.
I know that you you worked or you, um, your work is influenced by Simo Papert, uh, whom you 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 met or worked with. Um, does the, this um, have to do with that that experience with that influence? Absolutely. Um, I've been very very lucky to know Seymour for 20 25 years, and um, my work with him has really taught me the necessity of giving people time and space uh, with the right tools around them to learn. And the tools can be teachers, it can be materials, um, it can be the environment. Um, and one particular thing that I did with Seymour that was incredibly moving um, was we ran a series of retreats for teachers. Um, and in that, you know, I was I was about 20 years younger than I am now, um, and I didn't really understand how much teachers aren't given the opportunity to focus on their own learning. Um, they're sort of seen as a vessel to absorb information and then to pass it on to children. Um, but in these retreats, um, Seymour insisted that we work with teachers for five days. And we did this. Um, in a little island on the coast of Maine, and um, it was it was transformative to them, um, and it was transformative to me to see um, how much they grew um, just paying attention to their own learning. Um, and and one particular thing that I, I figured out is that we're often so scheduled that we don't give ourselves time just to think. And when I ran these retreats, I discovered that it. It worked better not to start until 10.30 or 11 in the morning. Everyone would get in the lab and start working at 8.30 or 9. And I'd keep trying to bring everybody together for a morning meeting until I finally figured out that they actually were getting much more out of not meeting and out of following the ideas that they wanted to learn and practice um, with lots of support in the room, lots of my staff helping them. Um, but but we have this thing about organizing our time down to the minute. So you're doing this for seven minutes and this for another seven minutes. And that's how we often organize our classrooms with kids. And the problem with that is we, we have zero time in there for a child to figure out his own voice and to, 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 to nurture themselves. That's amazing. So you're saying that actually moving to this kind of methodology is not not only um, not too difficult, but actually, or not too difficult in terms of uh, painful, but actually enjoyable. That that teachers can can uh, find reengage with their work and have fun uh, by yeah. doing that. So it's it's really very different from from what we imagine. Uh, I mean, teachers may imagine that they will become irrelevant, that will will be their role. But you're saying no, 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 no. This is really good for you. It, it's. I mean, a lot of people have terms for it, like the guide on the side, the coach, um, and it. You know, we can't spend the amount of time that kids can spend on the internet. I mean, it's just not possible. We're making dinner, we're doing this, we're paying bills. You know. Meanwhile, I have kids that I'll have taught, and they'll go home and spend you know four more hours working on their video game, and they'll learn things about the software that I didn't even know was in there. Um, but what they don't have that we have as an adults as adults is the ability to understand how to pace themselves and and how to have reasonable expectations and goals so that it really is that you're sort of the coach saying okay you're going to do a big video game that's going to have five different levels right and you want this done in a week um, now how do you think and now how long did it take you to make the first level well a day and a half so is that a reasonable expectation that you're going to be able to get four more levels done and we have three more days? Um, so it's it's really coaching. Um, and then, it's, so what do you need to do to do the next level? Do you think maybe we should make a bigger decision about your final project after you get one more level done and you can see how long that took? Um, so it's that kind of conversation. Fantastic. Um, it, looks, it looks like it's it's something that that is pleasurable for, for the teachers, that teachers get to enjoy it. It is if you're not doing it with 30 kids all at once for 45 minutes. Um, it, it's, any, it's a glacial change that we're looking at. Um, it's a glacial change. And so it's, it's maybe saying that Laura Allen, your teacher, is available for two hours, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 to 12. 
you need to have two meetings with her and show her what you've been working on. Um, but, but it's giving time back to children in a way and giving time back to adults um, so that we are more um, in control. The, the, you know, the learner is more in control. Fantastic. Laura, it, it seems um, pretty clear every day, it, it becomes more clear that we're headed into a big uh, industrial revolution uh, by the hand of compu uh, ubiquitous computing, uh, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, robotics, things like this. Um, how do we prepare kids for this future? Well, to be first to understand that they're preparing themselves, um, and we have to learn how to get out of their way to a large degree. I mean, we all know you have a problem with your cell phone, who do you go to? You go to your child. Um, and I think that what the skills our children need the most is creativity and sort of executive functioning, like learning how to organize large projects into smaller projects or learning how to organize a large idea into smaller ideas. So how do you learn to how to do those things by doing it based on something that is important to you? Um, not by saying, oh, we need to teach executive functioning skills. Let's create a worksheet on or a work, workbook on what does executive functioning mean? That means breaking down a project. Now every child is now asleep before you've even started. But um, I'll give the example of my, my 16 year old um, has decided to create a podcast. Um, he's a, a boy who absolutely loves a young man, Lego and superheroes and knows his comic book characters inside and out. Um, and he has a, a friend who is um, very interested in this but knows nothing about comic book characters and graphic novels. So they've created a podcast, it's sort of like the Siskel and Ebert, uh, you know, like two people discussing superheroes in movies. And every episode, they've now recorded about 18 episodes. And each episode, they both watch a movie and they both take notes and they do this individually. Um, and they, you know, they take a lot of notes on what they want to discuss in the podcast. And then in the podcast, they discuss what was the role of the superhero, what was the story arc, how did the superhero in the movie differ from the superhero in the comic book. Um, now, he, he has, I have been hitting him over that, not literally, but trying to get him to keep a Google calendar of his schedule for a while. And he finally said to me, oh yeah, I'm totally using the Google calendar to schedule all the podcasts. And, you know, so that the executive functioning came because it was something really important for him. Um, so that's an example. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's fairly clear. So you, you let them grow, by, uh, but, but you provide them missions that, that are relevant for them, and then you, you step out of the way and become a coach and a facilitator, uh, somebody who, who guides them through, through their search. Right, totally. But, but you also have to accept that you are going to have much more downtime and time where you're going to really question, are these kids using this time productively? Um, but my feeling about that is we have an awful lot of, at least in North America, a lot of kids who fall apart when they get to college or fall apart afterwards because they've had such structured lives that they don't know how to deal with not having structure. So um, that's a part of the whole change that we're looking at. Is, is really teaching kids about what does it mean to be productive in your time and why do you want to be productive. So I invited uh, several school directors to, to um, watch this, this interview. Who would you recommend to these school directors and, and to policy makers um, about how they can uh, help their systems or their schools to prepare to, to provide that kind of uh, experience and education? I think you start in small ways so that you can really see it work, so that you can believe it. So you might start by um, working just with a few children, with a few kids, and say to them, um, you know, we want to form a history class with you, but we're going to do it really differently. Um, we're going to start by, you're going to pick the area of history we're going to do. Um, these are not really new ideas, um, but I think that it's a question of 
having those ideas become a more of a part of society. Um, so it would be saying, you know, what area of history, let, let's create a Google Doc that we could all go to, um, which for many teachers will be in itself a, uh, a new frontier. Um, let's create what we want the goals of this history class to be. Um, maybe we want to do, a, you know, the history of a specific time period um, and compare that time period to today. Um, maybe we want to find what artifacts we have today that came from that time period. Um, and maybe together we want to create a blog of this going on. So and what would you recommend to parents? I would recommend that parents get rid of the term screen time <laughs> as such a negative. Um, because I think it's a little bit like saying um, I think we're, we're scared, and so we have this phrase screen time. But we, you know, I, I wonder if 300 years ago or 800 when the pencil was developed, did people get worried about how much people were using pencils? You know, I, I think that we, we get a little lost. Um, I also would recommend that they sit and play computer games with their kids and try to understand what they're doing. Because we, we're really quick at being judgmental that they're wasting their time. But it, it's, it's very interesting to really sit down and play with them and see what they are doing. Um, and I don't think it's all this sort of umbrella of negativity. Um, I, I think the key is to really be with your child as he's learning, as he or she is learning. Instead of sort of compartmentalizing it all into school, learning is everywhere and everything. Fantastic. And one last question. Do you see differences in the kind of impacts that these kind of um, program, uh, programs have on high-income and low-income uh, children? I think that our society generally has a tighter leash on low in, lower income kids and so it takes more time for them to become comfortable in this sort of driver's seat. Um, and you have to get there slowly not by having such an open-ended problem like what are we going to study in history, but to scaffold it more so that we're going to study this area of history, but what do you think would be interesting for us to learn about? Um, because if you have no experience controlling any of your time, you, you can't make that leap quite so quickly, generally. It, it, it requires a level of self-discipline and self-knowledge. Laura, I hear that we're fortunate that, that you're coming now to, to South America. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Will you tell me briefly about that? What are the plans? I mean, I think it's great that you're, you're coming because we need something like this. Um, I, I unfortunately can't give you the exact name of the conference I'm talking at. Do you know the name of it? Um, oh, there is a Congreso Tecnologico yeah, in, in Buenos Aires. Right. So I'm coming to speak at that. Um, and also, to you know, I'd, I'd be thrilled to meet with people about my ideas, about my work. We're getting ready to do this uh, winter summer camp in New York for kids from um, the Southern Hemisphere in January. And then we're getting ready to do a retreat for teachers completely born out of the retreat I used to do with Seymour Papert. Um, and that will be happening in, in February. So. Um, I'm going to start to work on learning more Spanish, and um, I'm very much enjoying this new chapter of my life. Fantastic. It's, it's great to, to hear that, Laura. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and, and the this, this inspiration that you provide, and thank you for sharing this time and these insights with us. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Bye-bye.